Yeah. So um, basically, John had, had never done a feature, and um, I felt this is just production stuff, Pete. You know that basically, um, it, it would be brilliant if he did a feature. And as he's getting older, so he's now like in his kind of into his early fifties. Um, I said, John, let's fucking be punks. Let's just do the thing. Let's just do it. Uh, you know, because now, you know, when we first started doing video, remember all the big port of packs and oh, cameras on sure. the shoulder? Well, now, Beta like, Max. yeah, Beta Max, all sorts of blooming things that has gone through. But now the D DSLR, digital SLR cameras, do you mean they're just like a, just like a camera? But yet, with interchangeable lenses, they are the quality of 35 mil. Do you know, so for the first time, you've got in an affordable space. Like if we shot the whole movie on one camera, yeah. one little camera, right? Uh, with you compare that to, remember the new homes, new roles. Sure. All that stuff in Belfast oh, and you yeah. came home and it was all, you can't, it's useless. Yeah, 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 because it's all just grainy. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I mean? So this is beautiful. So, we, so we thought, right, we've got a digital SLR, a couple of lenses. Uh, Final Cut Pro on his d desktop. So we got the tools production, so let's just do it. So what do we need? So we set about, we said, what have we got? We've got a flat in the city centre, which Dan Sturley's flat, and it's the top floor of the tower block. Is that the, the same one you used, the small heath? No, 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 no. It's just behind the rep. Is it? You know, there's a couple of tower blocks yeah. just behind the reps, one of those. So we had that, the, the, we had access to Dan's flat. There was another actor who I hadn't met, which is David, who plays the other part. So, you know, we said, let's just start. We start, uh, we, we'll just shoot something and then we will interrogate it and see where it might go. So that's how we started. We started with me arriving at the door of the flat. The guy was called Nev. Yeah, Nev, yeah. Yeah, knocking the door. Little, this is a clip on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just it, you know, so he arrives and then, you know, Nev goes, he goes, hey, Nev. He goes, who is it? And he goes, Spud, Spud. Yeah, man. Take away the beard. <laughs> <laughs> so that was where we started. We thought, okay, so where does this go? We knew it was about something about neurosis. So, and we also John had. So you shot that without a, the full story. We, we, we shot that. We shot that without a full story. Yeah. yeah. We just thought, let's have a starting point and then let's see where yeah. it might go. So we know what we've got. We've got a talk. We've got a beetle. Yeah. Because John's brother, uh, Paul, does kind of animated stuff. So he made a this three D beetle. So we knew we had a beetle. We had a flat. We had two old guys. What's the story? So um, then we uh, went and it was so, we knew it was kind of about something in the past, blah, blah, blah. And we, 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 we had lots of ideas and we kind of filtered around with them. And then we went and shot another bit out on the marsh where I'm digging. Mm. And uh, it the... This kind of MOD. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Planes. Yeah, yeah, and that's where John grew up, Skegness, near Skegness. Gosh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and that was kind of big, broad landscapes. Yeah. So we, so we thought, right, like we do this bit. Kind of, like yeah, but bit like a bog of Allen, yeah. Allen, yeah. And we had thought about relics because I'd known at that time that people were stealing relics. The relic of Saint Lawrence O'Toole was stolen, and da da da. So, um. So we thought, right, what is it? And we wanted something that would kind of have some sort of universal, recognisable. We thought of uh, Boudicca, you know, Boudicca, yeah. because apparently, according to one theory, she's buried under the McDonald's on Parsons Hill, you know? <laughs> Because at the end of the Roman Road, at the end of Icknell Street, and you know there were a few specific sites where they thought she might have been buried after this battle, and some archaeologists from Birmingham University decided that uh, that mound under on which uh, at Top Parsons Hill, on which the where's Parsons Hill? It's just up in Kings Norton. Isn't it? Yeah, just as you go up the hill, 
Yeah, because that's Hickneyle Street, the old Roman road. Yeah. And we were interested in this kind of thing of transitions. Sit, you know, like Birmingham, you go through a little tunnel and you're in the countryside. Mm. You, you know, ancient old roads, old walkways, pathways. And um, so during that time, during the research, I kind of came across this old myth. Uh, it was a pamphlet published in 1870 uh, attributed to a Warwickshire man and it was called How the Skull of William Shakespeare Was Stolen and Found right. and it told the story of a guy called Dr Chambers who in the 1790s um, came to not Alf Church not Alf Church but it's the other place it's near Alf Church it? one of those one of those places just out there Right. Um, I'll, um, tell me the name of some place. I did, I did, I did read. I should, I've printed some stuff off you know, before. Yeah, well, was it you can, begin with the B? B um, it, no, it's Bewley. That's where the skull ended up. Bewley. B E O L Y. Yeah. But he worked out there, so let's just say Alf Church for the moment. Yeah. It wasn't Alf Church. It was nearby. Studley. Studley. It's, no, not Studley, but nearby. And all those places are mentioned. Yeah. And uh, while he was out there, he became kind of involved with the local gentry. And one night at a dinner party <coughs> um, at Ragley Hall, uh, there was a discussion about how the Gothic writer Warpole, uh, who built Strawberry Hill in London, you know, that became a college in later time, but he built that as a Gothic mansion, and that he was offering, he had offered 500 guineas to anybody who could uh, present him with the skull of William Shakespeare. So Chambers decided uh, that since he had access to some grave diggers, which doctors did in those days, that he went with this group of three grave diggers to Stratford to dig up Shakespeare. They, In fact, when he arrived, they'd started digging up the wrong place because there was a Shakespeare in the graveyard. But Shakespeare, of course, is buried inside the church. So they got into the church... You know, we, we, we shot on Shakespeare's tomb. The final scene of this, we, we got permission to shoot actually on Shakespeare's tomb in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford. It's just like a slab. Do you know what I mean? And is, is there a curse written on the... Yes, yeah, yes, it says on the tomb. It says on the tomb. Dear friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to disturb the dust enclose it here. Blessed be he who spurs these stones. Cursed be he who moves my bones. Right? And uh, so Chambers, anyway, got the skull, um, according to this legend, got the skull, took it back. The, the geezer from, the agent from Warpole come up from London, didn't really want to hand over the dosh, trying to get it on the cheap, and Chambers wouldn't let him have it. So Chambers then had the skull, and I imagine that he knew about this curse as well, and he was getting a bit paranoid having the skull. So he asked one of the grave diggers, a guy called Tom Dyer, which is why Nev is called Nev Dyer. It's only a very subtle thing in the movie, but, mm -hmm. but he's called Nev Dyer. And Tom Dyer um, took... The, the, the skull back however unbeknownst to Dr Chambers when he started to prise up the corner of the slab it, it started to crack so he thought I better not and he didn't put it back and instead he took it with him and he at that time was with two other with his partner and somebody else they were holed up in the crypt of the old church in Bewley which is like an, an old 10th, 10th, 11th century church. And in the crypt of it, 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 the crypt was the Sheldon family's crypt, right? So he was holed up in this place. And one night he came to Chambers 
late at night and he asked Chambers to come with him because his, his partner had been injured. So he took Chambers, the church was being renovated which is why they were, had kind of got into the crypt and were living there. But what they were doing was they were melting down the lead coffins to make counterfeit coins. And the lead had spilt and the woman had been scalded. And Chambers came to the basement with Dyer and treated the woman. But while he was there, Dyer told him that he hadn't put the, the skull back and that in fact the skull was here in the crypt in Bewley. Um, Dyer later was hanged at Bromsgrove Assizes for forgery because it was a crime punishable by death. Right? And um, that's it. Right, so there's this pamphlet which you can go and find on the internet. I found it somewhere in an archive. And uh, you can read it, the whole thing. It's quite an interesting story. Now, whether it's true or not, I'm, I don't know. We went to meet the historian at, uh, and the, vic the rector of Holy Trinity in Stratford to get permission to shoot in the church. And they were intrigued by it, but they said, you know, mm. we know of this myth, but we do, obviously we don't. Yeah. There's a guy's yeah. written a book, hasn't he, called Who Killed Shakespeare? Who's that? Um, as I, said, I printed it off from there, but I don't think yeah. I, I picked up the paper. But there's, there's something yeah. online, there's a guy. Right, okay. 2013, I think, called Who, Who Killed From around here? Yeah. Um, right. Well, well. Anyway, they they said, you know, well, we we, we don't obviously we don't accept that that's the myth, you know, da da da. Um, so that was an ingredient. So the idea, right, bang, Shakespeare's skull. Dyer, Tom Dyer, Nev Dyer, Nev has heard this. Uh, so the backstory, which you don't really get in the movie, do you know what I mean? Because mm. we start the movie when they're old. Yeah. We start the movie 40 years after they went and stole the skull one night. Because one night when they were just kind of youths uh, in a drunken situation, uh, Nev had told Spud, you know, oh man, I know where the skull is Shakespeare. Is. Fucking let's get it, man, we could sell it. So um, Nev wasn't sure, you know, because he knew there was a bit of spook around it, you know, it had been passed down to his family, this information where it was. Uh, but Spud convinced them they should go and get it, so they went and they got the skull. Spud had, f meanwhile, found a buyer for it over at the far side of the country. They got the skull, they drove across country, Neb was freaked out, thunder and lightning, the car broke down, they arrived at the guy's house to see an ambulance there and the guy being carried out on a stretcher. So they'd freaked, even Spud had freaked, and they decided to bury the skull in this marsh, and they taken the, marked it out where they would, you know, paste it out where it was and the kind of compass thing. So they buried it and they made it a, a kind of pact that neither of them would go back without letting the other one know. Well, our story starts when Spud goes back to the thing, mm. but he can't find it. Right, so then he has to go and find Nev, and. Uh, that's, you know, and then realises that... Are you going to see the movie? I am, yeah. I've got I'll, go tell yeah. yeah. I'll go tell you. I'll go tell you. A few tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so they obviously don't... Um, don't release... I won't the, tell you all the story, you know what I mean? Not, story, that it's, yeah. not that it's really... It's not heavily driven like that, but... Um, we, we, you know, the process... That's the back story, right? Um, and essentially then we mapped out a, a kind of script, um, improvised, all the dialogues improvised, but we talked about it in advance, do you know what I mean, so that we knew what we were talking about. It's not heavy on dialogue, it's a visual, very much, you know, it's a director's movie, mm. and uh, we got permission to shoot in the church in Bewley, you know, where the skull was supposed to be. We got permission to shoot in Stratford. And the rest of it, it's like a road movie on foot. You know what I mean? There's no fast cars, no shooters, yeah. no beautiful women, da 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 And um, we thought, we're just going to work 
within a very tight frame. So after we'd done all the preliminaries, you know, got shot, John had edited up the first 12 minutes, we knew we had the Beatle and we thought, now the Beatle has got to be significant. So in my research, I, I, I read, was reading Shakespeare's sonnets. And uh, in sonnet, the sonnets were published in a folio of sonnets in 15, 1605, probably without Shakespeare's permission. And uh, there was a lot of speculation as to who, they were dedicated to two people, the, the Golden Youth and the Dark Lady. Um, the, nobody ever knew who the Dark Lady was. There was lots of speculation. Was she, in fact, the wife of the guy who published the folio and this was a kind of revenge because Shakespeare had had a, an affair with her? Was she a whorehouse madam in Shoreditch, a, a woman of black or you know of African origin, who ran this whorehouse where a lot of the players went in Shoreditch? You know, so who was she? But in uh, in Sonnet one hundred and thirty, it says, "If hair be wires, then." black wires grow from her head. So I thought, oh, the beetle is Shakespeare's dark lady. In our mm, mythology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you know what I mean? Because I just, that's a bizarre little description, isn't it? Mm. If her be wires, then black wires grow from her head. Mm. Which is why people thought, you know, this maybe you should refer to somebody of African yeah. Background, da da da. Mm -hmm. So we just use this notion because the beetle, the beetle talks. Yeah, yeah. And um, the beetle is Shakespeare's dark lady. And uh, in a way, she wants to get Shakespeare's skull back to where it should be. So I won't tell you any mm -hmm. a lot more about who, how she appears, but that's what you know. So we just kind of threaded together. Yeah the ingredients that we had and tried to work really kind of efficiently. So um, once we got, felt confident that now we have the whole story and we've got a kind of script art and so forth, right, let's go for it. So um, I managed to find somebody who was prepared to put a modest amount of money into it. Um, through an SEIS scheme which allows people to, it's a kind of tax thing that allows people to invest in film production and then claim tax break on it. Right? So um, this guy was prepared to let us have a, 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 an amount of money which wasn't compared with like making films yeah, was fuck all. <laughs> But it was enough for us to be able to go, right, we can employ two more actors, we can employ a sound person, John shoots it and directs it, um, Valeria works as our production assistant, drives, etc. And then we set the schedule to start at the start of September and shoot every fat for 20 days so Monday to Friday for four weeks so we shot the whole thing during that month and uh, then John went off and edited it we had a rough cut by January and initially we were we'd made it with the view to uh, we call it compact cinema Right, that's our the kind of company, Compact Cinema, and Compact Cinema, um, Compact Cinema presents da da da, but Compact Cinema, we thought it, it's like we would be channel channeling it to Vimeo, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like distributing it as small screen stuff. Mm -hmm. um, however. Like M M Mark Radcliffe watched it, and he loved it. He loved it. Wrote a really nice piece. Yeah. Gives quite a bit boost of confidency, yeah. you know. And but other people, we thought 
they said, oh yeah, you, know, you should get this out into festivals. So we spent the next, we had a little kind of premiere of it here, a small screen about it last July uh, for the crew and people who were involved. But uh, since then, John, we found a place at the National Film School that allowed us to do a video, a proper grading of it for cinema, you know, and uh, to do a Dolby, just finished the Dolby mix. Do you know what I mean? So when you're in cinema, the sound will be really good and the sound's important and it's minimal yeah. as it is. We, Mike Hurley, who has worked with me on many occasions, we brought him in to compose the music. Um, recorded it all very simply, actually in my back room, and um, very inventive Mike is, minimal, you know, John wanted something minimalist. I said, Mike's the man. I, I got him to meet Mike. It's Mike kind of more of that atmosphere. Isn't atmosphere, it? yeah, rather than thing, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, that, so, the, the, so Mike did the music, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we did an initial mix of the thing at Gavin Monaghan's in Magic Garden in Wolverhampton. Um, but that wasn't really a proper sound mix for putting it up on the screen, big screen. So we've now just got that finished. We, we, you know, we've just gone out in a bit of a limb just to kind of get that finished. And uh, this is our first festival, you know, so, um, be really quite quite interesting to yeah. sit in a cinema and yeah. and, and, and watch it watch you yeah, yeah yeah you know watch it the at the electric on the 20th yeah. at nine o'clock so um that's the kind of you know so it's very much about um kind of going against the green in a way you know what i mean that the actors are old you know there's no fanciness in it. We don't play to any of that. We simply stay within. We let practical get it done. We cut the cloth according to what we need. You know what I mean? And uh, let's not stray off into areas that we we can't pull off. You know. So keep it nice and tight. And. Um, we decided black and white and look best in black and white. That was for practical reasons as well. Because initially, you know, in the course of a month, trees change colour, light changes. When you start to try to add it together in colour, you notice those kinds of things. So we thought for practical purposes, we would work in black and white and then it would see, we didn't have the finance to go and do all the colour correction and, that you would require to do it in colour. And black and white, I think, really suits what the movie's about. So um, it's John's first feature, and I hope it ain't going to be his last, because he's a very, very fine director, do you know? And uh, it'd be brilliant to see him the next one where he's not having to be the, the, the cinematographer as well as the director, you know what I mean? So we did this, this is absolutely minimal, you know, bare bones. But um, at least we had the freedom to do what we wanted. Nobody was telling us what to do or, who, you know. Um, so and logistically, you haven't got a huge amount of people to be shipping around and no, organising. totally it. small. Yeah. You know what I mean? We were able to do it in one car. You know, we just hired a car, like one of those got a few more seats. But we were able to do it all, travel around, and shoot very effectively and... You know, had it all mapped out when we'd be at the church, when we'd be at Stratford, and you know, um, got a. I don't know if you've ever come across Michael West and King, Lou Daglish. Uh, they play a cameo role in it, and they're like uh, the, 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 they're kind of country singers. So, um, and we had a few gags running through it. You know that one of the gags, John had once said to me, his his idea of hell was uh, you know to be locked in a room with re Lady in Red playing uh. over and over again <laughs> so we had at one point thought you know that this was this guy because Spud's got he starts with this guitar case but he's got a yeah, spade in it spade, yeah you know what I mean and this kind this of, kind of yeah, this kind of 